organizers for putting on this very interesting workshop, which as uh, has already been mentioned, is bringing together people from quite different areas, uh, which for that, for that reason I will give a, a, uh, an introductory talk at least for the first half. So actually I'll spend almost the first half of the talk on item one on this list, which is to talk about the way uh, we uh, um, think about phase separation in passive systems, so thermal systems without the kind of active dynamics that Sriram and Ray were talking about this morning. But then I will uh, play variations on a theme in the second part of the talk to say how activity changes some things, doesn't change other things uh, in relation to this kind of decade-old set of facts about phase separation in <coughs> passive systems. So there's a list of topics there. The thing that is missing from this list is, is basically fluid flow, which I realize may be a bit disappointing to many in the audience. I do have some slides on that at the end if I have time to get onto them. I think what's important though for this talk is to focus on the diffusive part because that's where the instabilities are coming from in the models that I'm talking about. In all of these models, it's possible to couple these, uh, basically a, a, a diffusive density field to a fl um, fluid velocity. And um, as I say, I'll, I'll come on to that at the very end if I have time. Right, and apologies for not getting this quite full screen. Um, okay, so what are we talking about here? We have a density of some species, which is called rho, and it has some reference value. Uh, and uh, the kind of system that I'm primarily interested in, in here, it's an, the, the rho is the density of some particles. The particles can't be created or destroyed, <coughs> although the case where they can will come back up later. But in the presence of a conservation law like that, I can say there's a, a reference value, um, rho zero, which could be the initial density, it could be some other value. Uh, I'm going to define phi as the difference in density from this reference. Um, and because particles are conserved, everything's over damped here. I have basically diffusive motion of particles, but the particles can be coupled through all kinds of interaction forces. So the rate of change of phi is the divergence of some current as a consequence of which the integral of phi over the volume is a conserved quantity equal to phi, the initial value of it times phi zero times the volume of the system. And the easy thing, which is familiar to hopefully almost everybody, is the average current is some mobility, which we call m of phi, times minus the, chem the gradient of the chemical potential. So these particles have some interactions. They have a, a temperature, they have interactions, therefore they have a free energy. The chemical potential is basically the, the, the functional derivative df by d phi, it's telling you what happens to the free energy when I move stuff around. Um, and uh, so the, the average current is obeying this deterministic equation. But crucially, from the point of view of statistical physics uh, and uh, everything that I'm going to talk about, uh, there is also noise. So in soft matter physics, if you talk about diffusion, you can talk about the mean effect of diffusion, which is diffusive, but in general, there will also be some noise. So the density field will fluctuate. Uh, so what you have in the absence of the noise is you'd have a gradient flow structure on this free energy, so the, the system would be moving the global free energy downhill continuously. Uh, with the noise, instead of just converging to some minimum of the free energy, you instead end up with a Boltzmann distribution, so a probability distribution for density patterns that are given by exponential minus beta f, where f is this free energy function. So the way that you do that is you add uh, a noise term that's shown here. It involves the mobility m of phi, involves the temperature, that's all called square root, and there's a uh, unit white Gaussian random field lambda, which is a vectorial. So that's the random part of the current. So um, the form of that noise is fixed in systems with thermal equilibrium by something called the principle of detailed balance, which came up in Sriram's talk as a statement of time reversal symmetry. What happens is when the system reaches an equilibrium state, so the state given by the Boltzmann distribution, the probability of seeing some time evolution under this combination of gradient flow and noise is exactly the same as the probability of seeing that trajectory in reverse once you've reached the steady state. 
So the character of this noisy gradient play, flow is very specific and uh, lands on a state which is fluctuating with time reversal symmetry. So this has many deep consequences, which uh, uh, are the kind of obsession factor from statistical physics in this field. Namely, uh, if you know this, then you know the stationary state. I've told you it's the Boltzmann distribution. So that's sometimes called a stationary measure. Beta is one of the KT in this talk. From the equations that I wrote on the previous slide, you can compute the probability of seeing a particular time evolution. So that's usually written in terms of this action A, which is basically found by uh, looking back at this Langevin equation here. By the time I put the full current into the phi dot equation, that's a Langevin equation. Lambda is, the statistics of lambda is known. So from that, I can deduce the statistics of J, or more specifically, J plus M grad mu. So that's where this action here, A, comes from. I'll get this working. Oh, I'll do without that. Um, so these things are all uh, properties of the equilibrium dynamics. So uh, the origin of time reversal symmetry is because in these systems, which tend to exclude magnetism, so please do not... Uh, uh, Bear with me by excluding magnetism, because there won't be any my talk in, in my talk. So what that means is underneath this, these interacting particles, uh, there are some kind of uh, equations of motion which ultimately are Newton's laws, probably for a much bigger set of particles, including unobserved solvent particles, for instance. Um, and those have time reversal symmetry. So the precise statement of that, which is inherited from the underlying microscopic dynamics, which is time reversible, is that if I take the steady state probability of being in some phi one, and then look at the transition probability to a state phi two, which is a function of, as a field, as a function of position and time, and then that's the same as uh, steady state probability phi two times the uh, conditional probability of getting from phi two by phi to phi one, and that is pathwise. So in other words, any movie that I could see in the stationary state looks the same running forwards and backwards, or equiprobable running backwards. So and a consequence of that last statement is that in a thermal equilibrium system like this, I cannot have any steady state currents in the steady state. So the... Uh, average I should have put around this j equals zero. Uh, in other words, if I see a current, I'm just as likely to see the opposite current, and we'll see it equally often in that steady state. Um, that's a, a statement about the real space particle currents, but an equivalent statement applies at an infinite dimensional level in talking about the actual motion of configurations of the system in phase space. So I can't have a circulation in phase space either. So there, I cannot have a, a, a system which uh, cycles round between one pattern A to a pattern B to C back to A. That kind of circulatory motion in the most abstract sense is not possible. Sri Ram, you'll tell me what I've said wrong. Sorry, I'm not, if, it's, if it's really phase space you're talking about, meaning position and momentum No, no, no. Everything's yeah. overdamped. So you don't mean phase space. Configuration space, okay. excuse me. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. No, no. Okay. So the workhorse of this area, then, in studying the diffusive uh, uh, dynamics of a conserved set of particles, um, for the moment, as I've said, without uh, coupling to fluid motion, is called Model B. That name dates back from 1975. So I um, make some simplifications before setting up this model for um, just to make life easier. First is to take the mobility m of phi to be a constant. That has an advantage just in terms of uh, calculating things, which is that the noise in that um, uh, Langevin equation for phi becomes additive. That's a big enough advantage in terms of actually being able to compute things that uh, we're prepared to pay the price uh, in terms of physical realism. Um, we can take the temperature of KT to be one without loss of generality because I can just change the F to give me the same behavior and to choose a particular form of F, which I've written down here. So uh, this has a local part, which is a polynomial and is quadratic and symmetric. Again, there are, uh, this is primarily for reasons of simplicity. It captures all the physics that we want though, as can be shown 
and with, with more general functions, and a square gradient contribution there, which is written with kappa. Uh, the coefficient b is always positive. That makes the system ultimately stable. Uh, but the coefficient a, the quadratic one, can take either sign, so I can have a local free energy, f of phi, which can be convex, like a, for positive a, or it can be concave for negative a. So what happens is that for positive a, so that the local free energy is convex, its curvature, its second derivative is positive everywhere, um, then the, a uniform state at uh, global density phi zero is stable. It will fluctuate a bit, but it won't go anywhere under these equations of motion that I wrote down. Um, if the quadratic coefficient is negative, then I have global instability. And in thermodynamic terms, it means I'm looking at a free energy locally, which looks like this bottom picture here. And if I think of what the system is trying to do in an equilibrium system, it's got this dynamics, it's got diffusion. It's basically trying to uh, find the Boltzmann distribution, uh, which uh, to a first approximation consists of minimizing uh, the free energy, this f function, functional f. So in the, um, in the part of this curve between the two minima, uh, there's a global minimum which consists of putting part of the system with phi equals minus phi b and part of the system with phi equals plus phi b. Phi b plus minus, these are called the binodal densities. Um, and if I perform that phase split, so I just make some of one, some of the other, that's a phase separation. What it does is it drops the local part of the free energy onto the common tangent there. It's the same as finding the convex hull of the, this free energy function. Um, and then I have to worry about the, the, the less local part, the kappa piece, which cares about gradients. And what that does is in this state of phase separation, it actually fixes an interfacial tension between the two phases, which in this model are plus or minus phi b. So that's the global instability. Um, the, but if I look at this uh, free energy curve here, it's actually got negative curvature only between these two points, inflection points there. Those are called the spinodal densities, minus phi s, plus phi s. And in that region, it's not just globally unstable, it's locally unstable as well. So I can do, uh, it's called spin-only decomposition. I'll show you the stability analysis in a second. So I think this is, um, probably does deserve to be called an anti-diffusive instability. It's a, it's, it's, a, it's a state where because of the interactions between the particles, um, I can start with a uniform system, diffusive fluctuations cause uh, density differences to increase. And the reason for that is because they're driven by the uh, curvature of the free energy we'll see in a minute. So in that regime, uh, although I emphasize that there's noise in the equations of motion that I'm talking about for model B, uh, if I am in that regime, I don't really need dynamical noise as long as I have a little bit of instant uh, initial noise in my initial data. Because it's locally unstable, that will uh, drive the system to a state of inhomogeneity. So that's called spinodal decomposition. On the other hand, noise is essential more generally because if I start with an initial density phi zero, which is between the spinodal, where the thing becomes locally unstable, and the binodal, where it's uh, between the binodals, it's globally unstable, then I have a global instability but no local instability. What that means is that to get from um, an initial uniform state to the equilibrium state, I have to go over some kind of barrier. It's a free energy barrier, and it's the noise that takes me over that barrier. So I cannot understand the nucleation and growth regime, which is the, the, the basic thing that's happening at densities between the binodal and the spinodal density, without admitting that there's noise in the equation of motion for the density. Um, so the way the, the, the path that the system actually takes, it makes some kind of droplet. So if I start with mostly a low density phase and it's going to phase separate, it will make a droplet of dense phase. This is just like a, a droplet, a nucleation of a liquid droplet in some vapor. I need to calculate the free energy of that droplet. 
which involves its surface tension and a piece which depends on its volume. So I end up with a uh, critical droplet size and a, 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 a free energy cost for making that critical droplet called F star, which depends on the initial density, so phi minus phi b or phi zero minus phi b more correctly, it depends on the interfacial tension and the other parameters in the free energy. Um, and then this will happen at a rate which is exponentially small in the barrier height. As I say, without the noise in the equation of motion for the density field, it would never happen at all. Okay, so if I return to the local instability, the spinodal one, the antidiffusive one, if we ignore noise, as I said we could, linearize that about some initial state, phi zero. So then you can uh, just see what this chemical potential is doing. Um, so I expand it, and the key thing is that the, uh, the current cares about the second derivative of that local free energy at the initial density. And then there's the square gradient piece. So that equation for J there uh, translates into the one below it for uh, the time evolution of uh, density fluctuations, uh, just going into Fourier space where everything is diagonal and nice. This is linearized. So from that equation, you can see that um, if F double prime, so the curvature is negative, so inside the spinodal region, uh, I have a, a, a growth rate which uh, vanishes like Q squared at small Q and has a maximum and then is cut off and brought back down again uh, to restore stability at the highest Q because of the square gradient piece, kappa. So there's some Q star, which is the, where the top of this curve is, at which the growth rate is maximum, so that gives me a characteristic length. It involves the second derivative of F and the kappa term, and fluctuations at that wavelength, whatever may be present in the initial uh, slightly noisy condition, uh, grow exponentially faster than at other wavelengths. So that's what you see just happening there. So that initial stage was over very quickly. Before long, you hit uh, the quartic terms in the free energy. So this linear instability doesn't stay linear for long. And as the nonlinearity kicks in, you start to get sharp interfaces rather than growth of a single Fourier component. Uh, and then these, uh, the, the, the structure that you get by the spinodal, spinodal process starts to coarsen. So uh, this movie could be run a long time. It coarsens very slowly. It will eventually phase separate completely by this, what's called the late stage spinodal process. So I've said much of this already. Fastest growing modes are at some well-defined Wavelength, once they hit the nonlinearity, I then start to get sharp interfaces. That late stage is actually, uh, at that point, I've got coexistence almost everywhere. The system is either at plus phi b or minus phi b, the exception being the interfaces between those two regions. So I'm close to local minimization. So what that means is that the, 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 the free energy, what's left now, is the interfacial tension. So the system is still trying to decrease its free energy, and it's got to do that by reducing the interfacial area. So if I've got droplets, the droplets will coarsen. Uh, and they do that by diffusive currents, which flow as it happens from small droplets to large ones, contrary to what you might think of. So then uh, if, if you... Um, Look at that process called the Ostwald process, and it's true whether you have spherical droplets or uh, more complicated uh, ramified domains in this case. Uh, I end up with a characteristic length scale for that pattern, which goes like t to the one third and involves the interfacial tension because that's driving and the mobility, which is you need to allow the diffusion to happen. So this is deterministic, it's the deterministic evolution of slightly noisy initial data. If I add the dynamical noise, which I said was important, in this regime, basically because you have this exponential growth early on and instability, this answer is completely oblivious to uh, dynamical noise. So the end point of this is always complete phase separation. So no nice pattern as the final equilibrium state with the model I've talked about. Having said that, this process is quite important, say if you are making polymers, 
Uh, so and various polymer composites, there are more sophisticated ways to do it, but one way of uh, making a composite polymer materials, you start with some blend at high temperature, then it reaches the kind of structure you want, and you basically drop it in an ice bucket. And so as long as you want that piece of plastic to be below its glass transition, you can do this kind of thing above the glass transition, and then you can quench it. But then that's taking it out of equilibrium. If you want an equilibrium system to have structure in its final state, then you need to have a different free energy. So this is microphase separation. So it's easy enough to design, again, could be polymers, could be any other material, design uh, um, a, a, a material for which the free energy itself is minimized by, for example, a layered structure. And in soft matter, that's usually called microphase separation. Um, so here's an example. So all that's happened here is if I take the, took the previous model B and I wrote that, wrote that down in Fourier components for the quadratic term, that G of Q there would be A plus kappa Q squared. And then the quartic term, which doesn't have a nice Fourier representation, is written on its own at the right. So what I can do, for example, is if I, if I think of um, this free energy which describes A density, so that density could be a composition, for example. So I could have a mixture of A and B molecules. Phi would then be... The, a, 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 a local scalar variable which tells me the relative amounts of A and B and would vanish at some reference state which might be equal amounts of A and B, for example. If, and, and then that, uh, the pre energy structure that I wrote down there has you know, the tendency to phase separate when A is negative and it has a, uh, the gradient terms which create an interfacial tension between phases when that does happen. If I added to that for example, a, a, a Coulomb interaction, let's say a screened Coulomb interaction, which has the form shown there in red. Um, what that does uh, is to say to the A and B molecules, say A is positive, B is negative, they, they, they don't want to completely phase separate because I don't want to take all my negative charge to the left-hand half of the system and all my positive charge to the right-hand half. That would give me a gigantic Coulomb energy. Instead, what will happen is there'll be a particular length scale of which some local demixing tendency is balanced by this longer range interaction. So that's completely generic. The longer range interaction could be of any origin. And in polymers, it's just the fact, for instance, I can make polymer chains where there's a, a string of A monomers which are physically connected by a covalent bond to a string of B. And then on the scale of this large object, I'm going to have to make layers rather than face separate. So, uh, the key with that, then, is that, and the way it shows up is that this quadratic part as a function of wave vector Q has a minimum, again, at some finite Q star, which is now nothing to do with the previous Q star. This is purely set by equilibrium. And then I can think of this parameter tau, which is how positive that is at its minimum. That's going to control, as the equivalent of what was previously the A parameter, that controls whether I'm going to go unstable. So this free energy looks like, and uh, in a specific sense, is unstable when that tau hits zero. So that, and for that choice of g, tau is just some function of a kappa and c that I could write down. So if I think of this now, though, if I, again, if I start from a uniform state, then now fluctuations have a specific wavelength which the free energy wants them to have at Q star. And um, if you uh, do a minimization of this F, which is mean field theory, you ought really to worry about the fluctuations, which I'll do in a second. But if I just minimize that F, then at the point where that tau goes to zero, um, you get a formation of layers, which are cosine of that Q star times uh, in a random direction times position and with some amplitude which depends on A and kicks off continuously. Uh, in fact, it goes like tau to the one half. So as this parameter here vanishes, then, or it, this should be mod tau, it's, when, when this becomes negative, A goes like negative tau to the square root, a completely standard uh, sort of bifurcation type. 
phase transition. There is a twist, though, in specifically in microphase separation for layering, and that actually this doesn't quite happen the way I said because uh, of what the noise does. Uh, in fact, that transition uh, becomes discontinuous because of noise. So I don't want to go into the details of this, but it looks as that the, the, way, the way the noise conspires to enter the theory is it basically looks like it's changing the uh, changing that tau value. So as I make tau small, I get lots of fluctuations. The quartic term kicks in, and that makes it harder and harder to actually approach that instability. And actually, I can't approach that instability. You can't reach that instability if you allow for fluctuations in this theory, no matter how small. <clears throat> So um, the effective value of tau, um, in a sense which I could make precise but will not, uh, cannot reach zero. So what happens is fluctuations grow to a certain length scale. Um, and then to get from a state like that, where I have an obvious kind of length scale to it, but if I want to get from that to the ordered state, so a properly layered state, I have to wait for a nucleation event. So the noise comes in paradoxically twice. First is it stops me finding the ordered state, and then it allows me to find it. Um, and that is, a, as I say, a discontinuous transition at some uh, value of um, the A parameter, or equivalently tau, which is shifted to a more negative region than it would be just by the, the previous calculation. OK, so a couple more things before I start talking about activity. Firstly, um, I can do multi-species versions of Model B. So if I just make phi into a list of composition variables, so if I have a mixture of A, B, and C, then I would need two variables for the two differences if it's incompressible, or if there's also, if it's compressible, then I need one for each species. So um, the basic structure is that the current has uh, some matrix mobility um, and then the, the gradient of the respective chemical potential, so you can get cross diffusion generically. And then noises, and again, the, the time reversal symmetry uh, requires that that mobility is symmetric, that's ensemble reciprocity, and also requires the noise has a, a, a structure that mirrors the mobility matrix. So the noises have to be correlated in a specific way. Um, and also kind of automatically, having written that down in terms of gradients of chemical potential, at the bottom of this slide, it just says that if I take the uh, derivative with respect to um, one species of the chemical potential of another, then I can swap the indices over. So you can think of that last statement as uh, a statement of reciprocity. So ontology reciprocity is to do with the mobilities, but I can also think of reciprocity of forces effectively Newton's third law, second law, third law, whichever. I should know, sorry. Um, so the, the second derivative, if f exists, the, sec the second derivative is the same in either order. So, um, that, and that will be the case if I have proper uh, interaction forces of a mechanical type stemming from hum some Hamiltonian or other uh, between my particles. So adding species is fairly straightforward. Um, I can also add non-conservation. So all of these things will matter in the active half of the talk. Um, birth and death, chemical reactions. So what happens here, I've got um, some extra terms now. So I can keep the, no say I have one species, keep the noisy model B current as written down there, for div minus div J, there's the model B current. And then those other two terms uh, are called model A. So that's non-conserved dynamics. Uh, what I have there is I have a rate of change of phi which depends just on the chemical potential. So this is now, because I can change the number of particles, I can just move globally the density towards a minimum of free energy. I couldn't do that with conserved particles because wherever I increase the density, I've got to decrease it somewhere else. But now I can change the density uh, independently at each point. So I'm driven towards the uh, decreasing chemical potential. But again, that gamma coefficient there, which is some kind of mobility, depending on the chemical reaction rates, has to be accompanied by a noise term 
as written down there. That's a scalar noise now. And then the other requirement for this to be an equilibrium model is that those two, those two processes, the diffusion and the birth and death or chemical reactions, have to be governed by the same free energy. So subscript A referring to the uh, non-conserved bit of the dynamics, subscript B referring to the conserved bit, those are the same free energy derivative df by d phi. So what I have now is I've still got basically a noisy gradient flow. I can think of this as a, as a generalized mobility which involves this um, combination of conserved and non-conserved bits, but still it's for this to be an equilibrium model, the same uh, landscape is being moved down by both of those processes. Okay, so I've emphasized all of that stuff and let me now dismantle it all again for active systems. Um, Active phase I've up very quickly. Active systems break time reversal symmetry because they microscopically convert fuel of some sort into motion of some sort. That means that in steady state, I can have currents floating around, I can have things circulating about. There are infinitely many ways to break time reversal symmetry or detail bounds in principle. So the kind of spirit of this general approach, which is kind of Landau, Ginsburg, Wilson, channeled by Sriram and others like him, uh, is you look at the equations of motion and you say, well, what is the leading order or lowest order way in which I can destroy this symmetry? Because it, symmetry is woven into those equations for the passive systems in a deep way. And there are different ways to destroy them. If you think of those, though, as some kind of equations of motion which are developed via a gradient expansion and expansion in powers of the densities, then you can say, well, what are the lowest order terms that destroy um, this reversibility. But because the, the uh, reversibility comes from this strange conspiracy between the noise terms and the uh, diffusive decay, you have to have both of those before you can even talk about whether the symmetry has been broken or not. A disadvantage of, 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 of this focus is that it's often not so easy to see what the new terms might mean in terms of some mechanical description. So that's either a strength or a weakness, um, depending on whether you like mathematical or physical intuition. But the other point which Sri already made is if you come at it this way, then once you've discovered what the terms are that break detail balance or break time reversal symmetry, then in an active system, they will be there, unless there's some extremely good reason why they're missing because their absence is because the theory is protected by time reversal symmetry. That's the only reason they're not there. So many examples, Sri mentioned some of them, self-propelled self colloids, which can phase separate even with purely repulsive interactions, uh, which is not true for uh, thermally interacting colloidal particles, that's called MIPS, motility-induced phase separation. Subcellular structuring via liquid liquid phase separation going on in a very active environment. Pattern formation, bacterial colonies, et cetera. <coughs> Just some movies. This is a cluster phase, so-called. So this is actually an incomplete phase separation in uh, self-propelled colloidal particles. It will go on like this indefinitely. Uh, so it looks like it's done a bit of spinel decomposition and then kind of stopped, but it's still extremely dynamical. So it's not frozen. It just isn't moving any further along the spinel decomposition pathway. So that's called a cluster phase. Um, this is the formation of stress granules in some cells whose origin I can't remember. Those uh, bright green dots are uh, a phase separation in the cytoplasm, which is actually in this case caused by pulling on this set of cells. And if you remove that, it remixes again. So I won't talk about the mechanics of that, but this is a case where you're getting formation of a phase separation. It doesn't go to completion. Uh, if you leave the stress on, it will still not go to completion um, and then uh, gone again when you turn that off. Um, this is uh, bacterial colony growth in a uh, kind of pattern which was once called chemotactic patterning, but involves no chemotaxis, at least in 
this particular system, which was genetically engineered not to have any. Um, so that's a layering transition, and you're just inoculating with a small uh, blob of bacteria, and as they grow uh, and breed, they make layers like that. Um, these, these examples are um, from simulations. Those are all experiments. This is uh, something called Active Model B, which come up come up a bit later on. Um, let's maybe just get that going as well. So these are the kind of things, particularly the picture on the right. <clears throat> if you look at the picture on the right, this is violently breaking time reversal symmetry. That's a stationary state. It's highly fluctuating. If I ran a movie of that backwards, you would see something quite different. You're forming droplets in the, or bubbles in the middle. They go to the edges. The, the, the orange stuff is liquid, and the, the blue is vapor, if you like. Uh, and a so backward movie would have engulfment of vapor droplets at the surface going into the middle and disappearing. Uh, and this is something called active model H, which has, uh, has got the conserved fluid momentum, the equations for which I have not written down. Uh, yeah, so this is a system which is uh, phase separating, but has uh, the, when the interfaces uh, start telling the fluid how to move, uh, it stops phase separating. It goes to this dynamical but structured state. And finally, this is uh, active and passive particle mixture. Again, a computer simulation, not a field model, but actual particle dynamics here. Uh, and this is something which Sharon uh, talked about earlier of... Um, passive particles being pushed around by active ones. And they, I have more time to talk about that. I'll tell you exactly what's happening there. Oh, and here's something else. Uh, again, two conserved scalars now. Um, this is called the non-reciprocal Kahn Hilliard model. So that's something which goes into a kind of predator-prey-like chasing traveling wave pattern. So, oh, another one. Two scalars, one conserved. What was I talking about there? Oh, yes, this is um, uh, colloidal particles with uh, long-range uh, chemical interactions. So I have particle density, density of a chemical species. Uh, the chemical species is created by the particles, so that's not conserved, but the particle density is conserved. So that's another layer-like pattern. So there's many more of these if you go away from scalars, but I've truncated my talk deliberately at a maximum of a couple of scalars. Uh, this is a case I mentioned before where I have uh, two scalars, one, well, one scalar, sorry, the same scalar, conserved and not conserved. <clears throat> so, yeah, that was a small movie on the right. So, again, what you get strange structures, but what happens with the, the system on the right, that was, um, is, a, is a model for this bacterial system. It's a different initial condition, so uniform. So, instead of getting the rings, I get formation of blobs, and then these blobs reach a certain size and they don't go any further. Okay, so um, after just that zoo, let me talk about some of these cases. So single conserved scalar order parameters. So the, the direct uh, activization of the model I called model B. Here it is. So you can look at this, uh, the model B equations in blue with the unchanged J, which involves the gradient of the chemical potential and also the noise. And I can add the red terms there to the current. And those are the lowest order terms in gradients and phi's that break the time reversal symmetry that I talked about before. And those were the ones in that funny movie I showed you with the, the, the uh, bubble, bubbles inside a liquid droplet. So the first comment is that these terms are nonlinear, and that means that their effect on the spinodal instability, which is a linear instability, is minimal. In fact, it's non-existent to linear order. It does change, though, the, the they're, they're not gradient terms. They look a bit like the kappa term, but they aren't linear in the way that term is. Uh, you can think of it as uh, messing up the interfacial physics, which they definitely do. These terms have a big effect on the dynamics of interfaces once you've got interfaces. But the initial instability, which is linear, can't see these terms. So the effect on the, the final state, uh, the, the lambda term turns out to have a modest effect. What it does is it slightly shifts the phase coexistence. So what you find in uh, the, the model is that I've got this 
minus 5b and plus 5b are the two coexisting densities, and they both move in the same direction set by lambda. can go either way depending on the sign of lambda. So that makes a difference, but it's not hugely dramatic. The zeta term has dramatic effects because that can completely arrest and even reverse the uh, coarsening dynamics if it's larger. So here's an example. I'm starting now with the phase separated state and with a big enough zeta term, that's what happens to it. So, um, yeah, so I think I would probably want to call this anti-anti-diffusion <laughs> because the phase separation comes from the, the normal diffusion making the concentration differences increase and now I add the zeta term and I start with something which should have that and suddenly it goes backwards. Okay, um, so the mechanism of that was something we call the reverse Ostwald process, which I'll very briefly outline now. Um, if I have a droplet of some size R, what happens in the ordinary Ostwald process in the passive system is that the radius of curvature, uh, basically you can think of the interfacial tension, is creates a bit of excess free energy. That means the chemical potential outside that droplet is a little bit higher than next to a flat interface. So if I have a droplet and a flat interface, the droplet will evaporate and condense onto the flat interface, and that way I've got rid of this extra area of the droplet, whereas the interfacial area has just moved. <clears throat> so I've reduced the area of the system by sending a diffusive current from, in general, small droplets to large ones. The zeta term has uh, this strange effect of it interfering with that, uh, the local equilibrium of that interface, you can think of it as a pump. But it's a curvature dependent pump, which means that the chemical potential or the, the, the local concentration just outside this droplet is not what it would be without the active term. So at intermediate values of zeta, uh, what I have is diffusion from large droplets to small ones, which is very democratic, but is not the equilibrium case. And what's more, uh, it, and it looks like a negative surface tension from the purposes of that calculation. But if I look at closely at that interface and I say, well, is it stable? The answer is yes. So this is one of the many things that can happen in an active system. I might, I, in a passive one, I have an interfacial tension, which I can calculate from kappa and from the free energy. And now I have at least two, in fact, three different interfacial tensions, depending on what bit of physics I'm talking about. So I can be in this regime at intermediate zeta where the Ostwald process is thrown into reverse, but the, the interface of each droplet is still stable against capillary wave fluctuations. And then there's another interesting regime when I increase it further and it becomes unstable to both. Yeah, so I think I've said this. Um, however, the, interestingly, this term can't stabilize layers. It can stabilize droplets, but not layers. And that's because it only cares about interfacial curvature. If the interface is flat, then the term which is, corresponds to this zeta piece becomes the same as that lambda part, uh, which basically says that if I have a one-dimensional density profile, I can't tell the difference between these two combinations of uh, gradients and phi's. Um, so only interfacial curvature distinguishes those two things, so um, I can only get stabilization of curved states by the reverse Oswald process. But then that is what's happening here. Okay, next. Let's take two scalars. Actually, two scalars is easier than one because the first terms to break time reversal are at lower order than those zeta or lambda terms. So uh, there's my equation. I've got a, 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 a um, <coughs> matrix Mij, a uh, gradient of something that I'm calling a chemical potential. Um, and I can keep... The, so the way this has been looked at by two different groups, the Saha et al., so effectively um, Raman Galistan's group and Christina Marchetti, um, they actually choose to keep the, the mobility um, unchanged, actually because they choose it to be diagonal. So I can't make it asymmetric. Uh, 
But what you can do is you can mess around with what looks like the chemical potentials, but I can add alpha phi 2 to mu 1 and minus alpha phi 1 to mu 2, and then the second derivative is not equal. So I've broken the free energy structure by basically saying that uh, the two species have an, a, a part of their interaction which is not reciprocal. In other words, if species 1 wants to go towards species 2, species 2 wants to go away from species 1. So you have this chasing dynamics built in, in, in this incredibly simple way to uh, this model. So the equilibrium version of this is sometimes called Carnelian model. Uh, this is the non-reciprocal Carnelian model. So you see, I don't need any funny gradient terms here. I've got in the chemical potential, instead of having additional nonlinear gradient pieces, I've just got a breakdown of the symmetry that is implied by having a free energy. Oh, there is a, yeah, let me just say this. Um, the same structure, it basically, well, the same kind of structure emerges when I have active and passive mixtures. Um, the, the, uh, and, and the reason for that is by the time I've uh, linearized this, all I care about is a diffusion matrix Dij. So if that's passive, it's symmetric, so it's got real eigenvalues and it has a spinodal uh, where the first eigenvalue goes negative. So that's the spinodal instability. If it's active, it is not symmetric in general. So it can have complex eigenvalues. So that means that where you might have expected a spinodal decomposition, if the eigenvalue is complex, you'll get a traveling wave decomposition. So instead of growth, static growth of a, of a, of a stationary pattern at a particular Q, <coughs> complex eigenvalue, traveling waves straight away. And that structure already comes out from the active and passive mixtures, as well as from these two species with non-reciprocal interactions. <coughs> so the traveling waves, when you get them, they break time reversal symmetry, but they also tend to have sawtooth-like waveforms. Uh, and then an interesting thing which emerges from this is something called an exceptional point, which is uh, a point where uh, you have equal eigenvalues and collinear eigenvectors, and as you move away from that, you go from static to traveling density waves in this kind of model. So these, uh, is it, yeah, it's just happening. Okay. So I think this is from the Panas paper cited there. Uh, yeah, okay. So um, that's some, some traveling weight. So the, but um, <coughs> as I say, the, 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 the reason for them being traveling, I mean, physically it's fairly clear. If you've got two species, one of which chases the other and the other runs away, then you're going to get stuff like this. Okay, um, so that was the second example. Third one is to do this birth and death stuff. So <clears throat> this is what we had before. As written up here, this obeys detail balance. It has time reversal symmetry so long as the chemical potentials of the conserved and the non-conserved parts of the dynamics are both a proper chemical potential. In other words, they're both derivatives of the same free energy, F, with respect to the same density, phi. And that means that whatever you do with the conserved and the non-conserved dynamics, then up to the noise terms, you will be doing a gradient flow on F. So again, this can be broken at lower order than the, the gradient terms. I can just choose those two chemical potentials to not be the same anymore. So that sounds possibly a bit weird, but actually it's a very natural choice if you're thinking, for instance, of bacterial colonies or uh, any other active system where you have part of the physics wants to phase separate, but there's also some kind of population dynamics which change, changes the total number of particles. So the interesting case is when the conserved dynamics wants to phase separate, so it's following the uh, free energy structure implied by the blue curve there, and the birth and death dynamics does not. So the birth and death dynamics then say it's on the purple curve, that has a minimum, that's, I'm gonna call it the target density, it's basically wherever F is minimized. If I just took the non-conserved dynamics, so just the birth and death, 
that is where the system will go. It will go to a state of that density. But the, as I've drawn it there, and in many other cases as well, that density is in the miscibility gap of the phase separation. So I can't make a uniform phase at density phi t. But what's more, I can't make a phase separation because then I have density minus phi b and plus phi b, the two minima of fb, neither of which is stationary with respect to the both and f. So the system has to do something else. So that's what I just said. Um, you must get a microphase separation. You must get, well, you could get a, 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 a non-stationary picture, but if you get anything which looks stationary, it has to be patterned. <clears throat> and that is our explanation of the uh, movie I showed you before in the bacterial colony. You have something which has a reason to be phase separated, and that could be the standard motility-induced phase separation, or it could be some kind of quorum-sensing interaction, or whatever. Um, but also has birth and death with some uh, <coughs> dynamics that doesn't care about the phase separation. And I think something like that is going on in the subcellular phase separations as well. At least it could well be. So that's just the same movie as before. Uh, the right is various simulations. The, 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 this is not quite the model I've described it, but it's one which is definitely in the same class. It has just has a slightly more complicated free energy structure for historical reasons. But you see the same patterns in this, what we call model AB, with the two incompatible free energies. So there is an interesting thing about this, though, uh, which is specifically to do with the very simple structure that I just suggested for model AB. So there's the top, there's, there's the equation again. JB is the usual form. Mu A I just chose with that uh, um, to have its target density in the middle somewhere. So an interesting comment about it is what do these um, layer, layered states, what's going on in them? Well, what's happening in those is that I've got dilute and dense regions, and the dilute ones are breeding, They're in, increasing in numbers, the, 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 the particles in those regions are multiplying, and then because it wants to phase separate it, they are going diffusively to the dense regions where they die because they're the wrong side of the, of the population dynamics. So this is a steady state, as I've drawn here, but you can see it's extremely non-equilibrium because these green arrows, which are the diffusive fluxes, are large and static. So that's, you could never get that in an equilibrium system. But I could make myself blind to the green arrows. And I can ask, well, is the density pattern something that I can get in an equilibrium system if so high? And I don't just mean the density pattern, I mean it with the fluctuations. In other words, can that top equation there, with exactly the same structure as I've chosen, also arise in uh, equilibrium? And in special cases, it can. Here's a special case. I can choose the two chemical potentials so that the local parts do what I suggested before. So I have the 5,4 free energy for the phase separation. I choose an additional quadratic term for the birth and death to make that now convex so that its uh, target density is at zero. I also choose that to just cancel out the um, square gradient term from the uh, non-conserved dynamics. And then it turns out, by a miracle, that that equation of motion that I wrote down there for phi can be written in detail balance form. Uh, it has a complicated kernel for the mobility, but that's allowed. That doesn't contradict, contradict detail balance. So as long as I'm not looking at the current, if, if, I, if I care about what's conserved and what's birth and death dynamics, I will see birth here, death there, diffusive current in between. But if I close my eyes to that and I just look at a time evolution of the density, then for certain parameters in that active model, I can tune them so that it completely impersonates an equilibrium model. So that's this case here. Which is interesting to me at least because we then know that that model there is subject to the fluctuation effects on the ordering transition, which makes it become discontinuous instead of continuous. Uh, 
which would be an extremely difficult thing to show for a model that hadn't been somehow mapped onto an equilibrium structure. Okay, so um, let me squeeze in before those, just say a little bit, to just a, a small crumb for diehard fluid mechanics folk. So, in blue here, with a very slightly different notation, and red, this is active model B, so swinging back to that, single scalar wants to phase separate, but has these funny extra gradient terms uh, because of activity. Um, so the standard, there's a completely standard way, if I forget the red terms, of coupling this to a fluid flow, it's here. So it basically says my conserved scalar is now advected by the fluid velocity, V. Uh, so that's the extra bit on the top line there. Then I've got the Navier-Stokes equation for V, and incompressible, and in that there now lives a stress. So there's the viscous stress, of course, but there's now this additional stress, and it takes the form that I've written down there. Firstly, important for fluid mechanics people to know this, if you're talking about fluid mechanics at small length scales, the Navier-Stokes equation should actually be the Landau-Lifshitz equation, which has noise in it. And the noise has the square root of the viscosity multiplying it. And if you zoom down to small enough scales, you will see this noise. Anyway, that's there. Um, and uh, if I didn't have the red term, so this would be passive, then this would be called model H. And the only other thing which is uh, a twist on this is what is this coefficient alpha? So in model H, so if I want this, this set of blue and purple equations without the red pieces, I want that to have detailed balance, that's fine. But alpha, which I can compute because I can calculate the stress from the free energy functional, uh, it's basically kappa. So there's, and that, if you like, gives me a passive interfacial tension. Alpha equals kappa, and that's positive. What you find, though, is if you have if this phi is now the density of swimming particles, that link is completely broken. And there's another contribution to the stress, which you can think of as a swim stress, which can have either sign, depending on whether the swimming motion is so-called extensile or contractile, depending on uh, the flow pattern around the swimming object. So what that means whether or not I include the red terms here, these are now optional extras because this alpha is more important than those terms there. If I change alpha by adding activity to what is otherwise a passive model, um, at first it looks fine, but I can make alpha negative now. If a sufficiently extensile swimmers, that alpha, the swimming part, cancels and overcompensates the passive interfacial tension. And the way this looks is like that. If there's my density gradient, say, between a dilute phase at the top and a dense phase at the bottom, and I have an extensile swimmer, what happens is that at the interface, the swimmers are oriented. The swimming direction aligns with the gradient of phi, one way or the other, but in general, that coupling is present. And if it's extensile, the fluid flow pattern is like what's in red. And if you think of that object doing that to the fluid, that's just like having a negative interfacial tension. It's trying to stretch the interface in the opposite direction to what thermodynamics would be doing of trying to shrink it. Okay, so that's active model H. Just con con conclude with a couple of movies on that. So there are various regimes here, uh, depending on what's happening with those red terms. I can have diffusive coarsening with interfacial stretching. That's this movie here. So this, again, is pretty much a stationary state, but you can see it's a very dynamical one. So I have a pattern of very deformed droplets. Um, so that's, we call that interrupted phase separation. It does not, that length scale does not continue to grow. And that's because this, the active stretching of the interface is compensating what the uh, diffusion is trying to do. Um, is that the same one? Let's try this. I can also go to this... Um, anti-coarsening regime, where the, the Ostwald part, the diffusive dynamics, wants to make the droplets all the same size, which is nearly achieved here, but now the droplets are still trying to stretch their interfaces. So that one 
has managed to arrest. So depending on the combination of these different pieces, you can either get a, a structure which is basically a frozen structure on a certain length scale, uh, or this highly dynamical structure which is always renewing itself. Okay, so let me just wrap up. Equilibrium phase separation, which I spent half the talk discussing, I have, if you like, deterministic anti-diffusion of the <coughs> spinodal. This is a basic process. You have a linear instability. You make uh, a inhomogeneous uh, density pattern, but it coarsens forever. So you don't have a, uh, you haven't really made a structure except transiently. Importantly, though, that deterministic anti-diffusion is one facet of equilibrium phase separation. The other is nucleation and growth. And to understand that other, I have to have the right noise terms in my equations. Uh, in the austral regime, which can arise at late, late times after either of those processes have kicked things off, um, I have a diffusive dynamics which drives the coarsening by taking a flux from small droplets to large ones. So you might think of that as anti-diffusion. Too many antis. If you want microphase separation, you have to have interactions in your free energy that want it. There is no other way in equilibrium of getting a patterned structure rather than a completely phase separated structure. Once things are active, this basic spinodal instability isn't really altered. Nucleation growth does change a lot. That's because of these effects on the interfacial tension which set the nucleation barrier. And indeed, I can collapse the nucleation barrier completely when I get into the reverse Ostwald regime, etc. Um, so it changes a lot there. Um, in the reverse hospital regime, yes, that's changed a lot again. Uh, anti anti diffusion question mark. Um, and then the point, perhaps the biggest point, is that once you have activity like this, you're, you can get microphase separation without any inbuilt interactions that say, I want microphase separation. It's by a dynamical competition. <clears throat> so, a competition between what the active forces are trying to do and what the equilibrium forces are trying to do. Uh, so fluctuating droplet phases in active model B plus, uh, layers sustained by a phase separation flux that is then compensated by birth and death within the layers, that's the model AB, and traveling waves uh, in the case of the non-reciprocal carnelian. Zero minutes left. Thank you for your attention. Probably done. <laughs> Welcome, yes, please. Mike, um, in that model that uh, you said could be turned into an effective equilibrium model, yes. does that mean you, if you take those stochastic PDEs and calculate uh, action forward, action back, uh, and log of P forward to P back? Uh, we yeah, well, so there's two ways to do it. You can either treat the, uh, you can either say that the phi dot is the sum of two pieces. Yeah. And if you want the trajectories as defined by the trajectories of those two pieces, they are deeply irreversible. But if I just look at the density alone, so that's the only variable I keep, then, then the action in terms of... What is the other variable? Let me, I just missed something there. Well, I mean, there isn't another variable. No, I just I obviously missed it. Well, it, it, it's a matter of whether I write it, whether, whether I use J as a dynamical variable, or just phi. So before I had j minus grad mu phi squared as my action, and j for sure can tell whether I'm running the movie forward or backwards, but I can also write an action which only involves phi. And then phi, uh, the, 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 then that's a dynamics of phi in which I do not discriminate between changes of phi caused by diffusive motion or changes of phi caused by birth and death. So then I can write an action in projected onto phi alone so I, okay, and I, that I, has the reverse ability. That's what I worried about, because J is, I mean, it's not dynamical in the sense of having an independent G, DJ over a DT equation of motion as such. No, but if you think of just defining a trajectory, no, yes. I can either define it by the pair J and the bit of phi dot which comes from A, or I can just define it by the sum. And these live in different dimensional spaces, and one is reversible and the other is not. Instead of A, 
disturbing. You want to say wonderful. Uh, Peter. Yeah, right. I wondered whether you'd, um, there's any motivation for including some kind of imposed spatial anisotropy in the sorts of models I'm asking this because, you know, I've been looking at the latest model for um, evolution of moist and dry regions in the tropical atmosphere. Yes. And, um, there one can motivate a spatial anisotropy. Well, there are cases where you can, <coughs> for sure. Um, so, well, firstly, there's gravity, which I didn't talk about at all. Um, there, I mean, there, there, are, there are some studies which do, for instance, uh, just decide that the self-propulsion speed of a particle depends on which way it's pointing. And Michael de Frucht, who's two seats away from you, and I have a paper on that. Um, <laughs> where, 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 um, whether that's particularly well motivated by any particular experimental setup, not quite so clear, but I think, I think there are definitely, I mean, let's let put it this way. It's th those cases are realizable in the, in the lab. So it's a matter of persuading an experimentalists that they're interesting rather than saying, oh, yeah, obviously this happened, so you need to do it. Um, there may be cases where, where it's... The, the other thing is that um, a lot of active systems end up being quasi two-dimensional because everything sinks to the bottom and then moves around there. But um, there are other cases where I think um, you could certainly expect spatial anatomy. Thank Mike again and Brett for our tea.